Dr. Atchison here, and we're on our second lecture of our sensation and perception chapter. We're going to be talking about vision. So we've got to go a little bit um, into physics um, when we talk about vision, um, because light um, is what vision is, is seeing. Um, light has properties of both waves and particles. Um, so light, as you and I know it, is a tiny, tiny little sliver um, of this great larger electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so if you look um, here on the image, we see that um, visible light, there's a little light bulb and right above it is visible light. And that's just a tiny, tiny, tiny little spectrum, a little tiny sliver of this greater spectrum that includes things like radio waves and microwaves and infrared and ultraviolet and x-rays and gamma rays. Um, so this really, really large spectrum um, and visible light is just this tiny little sliver of it. And the different wavelengths within this tiny little spectrum of what we see as visible light um, really is what reflects the color to the organism. Now we'll talk about color a little bit more later, um, but you can see here that different wavelengths represent different colors. So we'll see the red light um, wavelengths being a lot longer, and we'll see the blue wavelengths being a lot shorter, and green is gonna be kind of more of a middle wavelength. And again, this is within that spectrum of the electromagnetic spectrum um, that light is this tiny little sliver of. Okay, so that's our basic cover of what light is. Um, and these different wavelengths will be important um, as we talk about vision here in a bit. Okay, so we got the light part of the mechanics. Let's do the eye part of the mechanics. And um, so again, we're gonna do a real quick glossary um, over the physiology of the eye. So here's our eye. Um, our eye is actually, um, what we think about it as, as our eye isn't really what's doing the majority of the work. The light goes in through um, our cornea and in through our iris to past our lens um, and to the back of our eye um, where we have the retina. You can kind of see here there's like a peachy like C shape all along the back of that eye. Um, that's the retina. And what we also have there um, is the fovea, which is really that central point of focus. So when you're looking at something, um, right now I'm looking at this eye, picture of the eye that's on the screen, I'm putting the image of that eye on my fovea. I'm focusing um, on that and I'm putting that image on my fovea. Now when that image goes onto my fovea, it actually flips upside down. And so you're actually getting kind of a mirror image of that, a flipped upside down image of that, much as you would with a camera. Okay, so our retina again, here in this image is that whole yellow, um, kind of reverse C-shaped section of the eye. Um, and this is where our photoreceptors are. Um, and our photoreceptors are those specialized neurons that can convert, that can transduce that electromagnetic energy into the electrochemical energy that we need for neural signals, okay? So it takes that light and it transforms it, it transduces it into neural signals in the brain. Again, we see that little dip section in that retina. That's our fovea. And again, that fovea is really the center of the retina um, where we, when we're focusing on something, when we're looking at something, um, that is going to be being put on our fovea. We're foveating on it. Now there's two different kinds of photoreceptors in the retina, um, and they're both neurons. Um, so the photoreceptors are just a specialized kind of neuron, um, and both are transducing light into neural signals. Now there's two different kinds and they have different jobs. Rods are really, really good at low light. So when we talked about the absolute threshold of light, and we talked about um, on a clear, dark night, being able to see a candle flame at 30 miles away, those are your rods. Your rods are really, really good at finding things in the dark. They're really, really good at detecting light. And you have rods kind of throughout your retina, um, except in one area, and that's your fovea. Um, so you have ro rods kind of throughout, and you have more rods. In fact, the further you go out from that fovea, the more rods you have. Now, they are really great at detecting light. This is what we're using to see in the dark. Um, but do you see well in the dark? 
no, no, you don't see as well in the dark. And that's because rods have really poor acuity. Um, you're not gonna, you don't see as well. They don't give as much detailed information um, as the other kind of photoreceptor. And they also provide very, very little information about color. So if you think about trying to find your shirt in a dark room, trying to find the difference between your red shirt and your blue shirt, that's difficult um, in a dark room. And the reason that is, is because your rods are not very good um, at telling you anything about color. What is good at telling you about coat color, what kind of photoreceptor is good, are cones. And cones are really giving us all this information about light. They're giving us the differences in color. They're giving us greater acuity. So you notice I've underlined and bolded this C here in both cone and color. That's the easiest way to remember that cones are the ones that are doing color processing um, as cones and colors both start with C. Um, whereas rods are gonna be doing that light. Um, and so that's kind of what's left over. Um, Again, cones are what's giving us the detail in our image. The cones are what's telling us about what colors things are. Um, and so our FOVA really can, has a very, very high density of cones. So when you look at something, and again, you're putting that image on your fovea, um, the reason you can see that so well is because you have a really, really high density of these photoreceptors that are able to translate all that information into neural signals. And the more neurons you have doing that, the more information you have going in. And so this is why you got such good acuity on your fovea. Um, when you look at something um, is because you have so many more neural cells there. You have so many more photoreceptors, sensory receptors there to input that information. And the fovea contains no rods. Um, it's really just kind of outside of the fovea that those rods start. Um, and the further out you get, the more um, populated they are as compared to the cones. Now, rods and cones, where are they getting these names? Again, nobody's trying to trick anybody at anything. They're named for their shape. Um, so rods really have this kind of rod-like shape on their outer segment, whereas cones have this more of a cone shape. Um, and so, again, these are neurons, um, so they're going to have the nucleus, they're going to have the synaptic terminal that's going to convey that neural information on to subsequent neural cells. So they are a kind of neuron. Um, again, we've got this outer segment, though, that's doing that transduction um, from one to the other. And again, they're named based on their shape. You can see an actual picture of what rods and cones look like here. Um, cones are the more yellow and um, I'm sorry, rods are the more yellow and cones are the shorter red ones. So the information goes, the light comes in through your visual field, in through your eye, onto your retina, um, which is again here that yellow area on the eyes. Um, and as we've talked about before, um, this how the brain is organized and you're getting information from different sides of your body still works with the eye. Um, the only difference is, is it's not that your left eye is sending information to the right side of your brain or your right eye is sending information to the left side of your brain. What's happening is information that's on the left of your visual field. So again, if you're looking straight ahead and you're looking, um, say at the dotted line that's kind of between the eyes, if you're looking at that where it says neural signal, everything to the left of that is in your left visual field and everything to the right of that is in your right visual field. And the information in your left visual field goes to the right side of your brain. And the information in the right visual field goes to the left side of your brain. So this is why, again, split brain patients can really compensate very, very well um, is because they're still getting information um, from both eyes um, to you're getting both left and right information into both eyes. And so while um, that corpus callosum is severed in those split brain patients, they're still getting information from both the left and the right visual field um, in each eye. Okay, so let's talk about some theories about vision. Um, mostly we're going to focus on color theories. Um, we'll talk a little bit about other things, but two main theories that we're going to talk about are color theories. The first of which is the trichromatic theory. Um, and again, these names are ex trying to be self-explanatory. So chromatic is color. So you know we're talking about a color theory. And trichromatic means that we're talking about it's a three color theory. 
And it's the first scientific theory of color vision, and it was proposed by Helmholtz. And just as the name says, he proposed that there were three types of cones that were sensitive to different wavelengths. He said that um, there was a particular kind of cone that was sensitive to red light, these longer wavelengths. He said that there was a particular kind of cone that was sensitive to this medium wavelength, green lights, for example, and that there was a particular kind of cone that was susceptible, that's sensitive to these short wavelengths in blue light. Um, so he, they're named long cones, medium cones, and short cones. Um, and it was about the kind of wavelength that they were sensitive to. So that's what his theory was about. Now his theory is, um, says that colors that other than the red, green, and the blue really are stimulating a combination of cones. Um, and it's not that a short wavelength cone can only detect short wavelength light. It's just it's best at detecting short wavelength light is what his theory says. Or a long wavelength cone can only do long. It's just saying that the long wavelength cone is best at that. And so these color combinations um, really are activating multiple cones. This really um, has evidence um, in red-green colorblindness. Um, there are other theories that we're going to talk about that are kind of newer, um, but the trichromatic theory is a really a, a good foundation on which the other was built. So here's um, an example of that red-green colorblindness. Um, it's depending on your screen, it may be kind of hard, we may disagree about what numbers are here. Um, I personally see 74. Um, you may see another set of numbers. But I can see that because I have, um, my eyes are activating um, different colors. I can see different colors um, with my vision. Someone who has red-green colorblindness wouldn't be able to see any numbers here um, because they wouldn't be able to differentiate between the green dots and the red dots. Okay, so our next theory um, has a little demonstration first, okay? So I want you to kind of look, I want you to foveate, um, focus on that black dot that's in the middle of those four squares and do it for about 30 seconds. If you do it a little bit longer, it'll work a little bit better, um, but just stare at that for about 30 seconds. So just go ahead and pause the video and stare at that for about 30 seconds. You can just count in your head. Okay, so what do you see now? Um, if you did it, um, which I hope you did, for about 30 seconds or more, um, you should have a really strong after image. Um, and what that after image is, is the kind of the opposite of the colors, okay? Um, this after image um, is because of this opponent process theory. And the opponent process theory says that there's not three basic colors, that there's actually four basic colors. Um, and that these are really divided into two sets of color sensitive neurons. We have the red green um, and we have the blue yellow. So when you were looking at the blue, um, you should have had an after image of yellow and when you had, saw the yellow, you should have seen an after image of blue. The red, you would have an after image of green and the green, you would have an after image of red. Um, each color opposes each other. Um, the way that this after image works um, is that by staring at this black dot that I had in the middle, um, your color, your cones are getting worn out um, just staring at the blue, the green, the red, and the yellow, um, and they kind of become less sensitive. They become kind of less sensitive because of this overactivation. And because of that, um, when you take that image away, the reverse is shown because they kind of, this color bleaching um, that, kind, that, that went on in your eyes. And so it'll just take a minute and it'll, it'll go away. Um, but each color opposes the other. Um, and in that color pair, both colors cannot be stimulated at the same time. So the blue and the yellow were being stimulated in different areas. And then when we got that flip, um, when we got that after image, it was because of this kind of then activation of the reverse um, because of this, um, this kind of bleaching that we had um, by staring at those images for so long. Um, the black and white are also an opposing pair. So if you had done this with something um, that was black, you would see white um, when, you, um, when you looked at it. So there's some other good ones that you can search where there are American flags that are green, black, and yellow. Um, and when you look at them, um, for a long period of time, you'll get an after image where it has the correct red, white, and blue. I believe your text has um, the uh, Union Jack, the, the flag from Great Britain, um, where it has that same kind of color pattern. 
So this is the other theory um, of color um, that is one of our more current theories, um, but there we, we know a lot more about it really on the neural level now, but this was kind of the big second theory um, of color processing. Okay, so now we're gonna start talking about form processing in vision. Um, one of the big theories about form processing um, was what's called gestalt psychology. Um, and gestalt really means a form or a whole in German, okay? So these were German psychologists um, that had a theory about how we process things, how we decide um, that in, a visual, in our visual field that our cup is our cup and is not part of the wall or part of the table, how we are able to pull that image out compared to its surroundings. Um, and so again, this gestalt psychology was founded in Germany, um, and it's the idea that people are organizing these sensations into meaningful holes. So when you look at this image, um, it is really an image of eight dots um, that have um, white lines in it, eight blue dots that have white lines in it. Now when you look at it, chances are that's not really what you see. Chances are you see a cube. And the reason that you see this is because we're really good at detecting forms and we're really good at trying to put meaning there. Um, it doesn't really make sense that there's just eight dots that have these random lines in them. Um, what does make sense is that there's maybe a cube on top of these eight dots. And so we see a cube there when there's really maybe not. Um, so this whole is more than the sum of its parts. This is the idea behind gestalt psychology. Um, is that and gestalt theory is that the whole how we we group this is going to be more meaningful and have more information um, than the, the pieces that it's made up of um, so again there's more here than we see more as a whole and um, then those eight objects really um, are presenting part of seeing this whole um, is allows us to view faces and other objects as distinct from their surrounding. And this is what we call figure to ground. How we determine a figure out of the background, okay? And this can be, you know, and I'm, you'll, you'll have seen these kinds of images before, these figure to ground images. So here's a famous one. What do you see here? This is one of those reversible figure to ground illustrations um, where one image um, can give you two different perceptions. So you can either first, and usually what I see first is the vase, which is the white image. Um, and so I see a, va a white vase as the figure on a blue background. Now, because this is a reversible figure to ground, there's another image there. There's also two faces um, looking at each other, and those would be the blue images, and I would see two blue faces on a white background. Again, this, the stimulus is not changing. The sensation is not changing. What's changing is your perception of that sensation. Um, and this is that reversible figure to ground. What are you pulling out as the figure and what are you pulling out as the ground? Now, the reason this one works um, is because of a number of different things. Um, these grouping properties that we're going to talk about in relation to gestalt psychology. So again, this figure to ground is that organization of our visual field into objects that stand out from their surroundings. Again, how do I know my cup is not part of the table? How do I know my cup is not on the wall? Um, I, I group the pieces of that cup together and have them separate from other objects in my visual field. And we do this grouping um, by finding meaning um, in these, making these meaningful groups. And we do it in a number of different ways. We're gonna talk about a couple of them. Some of them include proximity, continuity, and closure. So again, in this grouping is this is our tendency to organize stimuli into coherent groups. So one of the ways we do this is proximity, okay? Um, when you see this, you're likely to see kind of three kind of bars as opposed to six lines. And the reason you're doing that is because the two of the lines are closer to each other. Um, they're kind of paired off um, as closer to each other. And so because we're trying to seek meaning in, the, in our surrounding, we're gonna see those more likely as three bars as opposed to six lines because of the proximity to each other of the lines. Another thing that we're doing is similarity. Similarity here, we're more likely to see uh, a column of, of triangles, a column of circles, and a column of triangles, as opposed to a three rows that contain both triangles and circles. Um, so we're more likely to group those into columns than rows because of similarity. 
Another one we have is continuity. Um, the idea that here we're gonna be likely to see a squiggle line and a straight line, and those two things are separate, and that one is kind of on top of the other, and that's because of continuity. We're more likely to say, hey, that makes more sense, than we have a bunch of half circles just kind of lined up together. Um, so this idea of continuity allows us to group these into two distinct things as opposed to several distinct things that really don't make any sense. Again, we're trying, the idea behind grouping and behind these gestalt psychology um, is that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, remember? Um, and that we're finding meaning in these things. Another one we have is connectedness. Um, so in terms of the vase and in terms of the faces, we had connectedness going on in both of those situations. We also had um, symmetry going on in both of those things. Both of those are going to be things that we use to group things. Um, which is why you could see both the vase and the faces and you can kind of switch back between them um, is because we're using these things um, for, for grouping. So connectedness, we're more likely to see six, three barbell kind of shapes than we are to see six dots with three lines. Um, because again, we're going to see these, because of this connectedness, we're going to see these as distinct objects um, as opposed to just this kind of random um, idea of that the lines just happen to coincide with the dots, we're trying to seek meaning. And so we're going to group those things together. Another one of these is closure. Um, this, these images are illusory contours. Um, on the one on the left, you're likely to see a triangle um, on top of three circles. The reason you do this is because there's not closure there. We don't have those lines closed off. Um, and so you're seeing, with air quotes, um, this triangle that's really not there because there's not closure. Where the image on the right has closure the, and they look like C shapes then. Um, that don't necessarily have um, a, a triangle present. Um, or if it is, it's not as distinct for you. Um, again, this is because of closure, our idea that we're using this grouping. Um, so you can see here with the, what, the image on the left, the illusory contour, um, we've kind of got a figure to ground situation here, right? So the figure in air quotes, again, is this triangle that's on top of the background of these three circles. Again, this is um, that, that idea that how our brain is grouping things, and one of the ways it's doing that is closure. Again, notice all of these, we also have symmetry going on. Um, again, symmetry is going to be a really important part of this as well, which is why um, that figure to ground reversible image um, was so symmetrical, as it allows us to be able to flip back and forth between them. Okay, so on to our next topic in vision, depth perception. Depth perception is really the idea that we can see in 3D. Now your eye, the image that's going into your retina is actually a 2D image. Um, you're not getting that depth. The way you get depth is what's called stereopsis, which is the idea that you have two eyes and they're seeing different angles of the same thing and your brain combines that um, into a three-dimensional image. This really is very helpful and it allows people to judge distance. Um, it's really, really important as, as demonstrated in this cartoon um, where this man doesn't have depth perception. Um, and so he thinks he's about to jump off a building, but really he'd be jumping off a curb. Um, one of the ways that we study depth perception is the visual cliff. Um, your book talks about it. Um, this video will sh show you some about it. And what we find is that depth perception is really developed through self-locomotion. So your book talks about crawling having an important role in that, and it does, because crawling is typically the way that most children exhibit um, their first attempts at self-locomotion, the first attempts to move themselves around their environment. Um, this video that is required, um, which is you can either is linked here, it is linked on the YouTube playlist, and it's linked in iCollege. Um, and again, you only have to watch from minute one to minute 635 really shows how we can manipulate in an experiment with the independent variable of giving infants access to self locomotion before they can crawl and are able to influence depth perception. So this is a really good video. It both walks you through the visual cliff, which will be very, very helpful. Um, and it walks you through some of the research that we see how self locomotion is really important in that depth perception. So if you remember back to our developmental chapter, we talked about this idea of dynamic systems and how a change on 
on one level can cause a reorganization on another level in development. This is a prime example of that. A change in motor development creates a change in visual development. We develop depth perception because of our ability to move around our own environment. Um, so again, this idea that it's this web of development instead of just lines of development. The last thing that we're gonna talk about is perceptual constancy. Perceptual constancy um, is also one of those things that allows us um, to have the issues with um, illusions much as that we have top-down processing. So perceptual constancy is what is our understanding that objects don't change um, just because the retinal image might change. So just because of how the image is hitting your retina um, doesn't mean that the the object itself has changed. So your blue shirt um, in sunlight looks different than your blue shirt in your dark closet. Your blue shirt um, in under, you know, maybe unnatural lighting compared to sunlight, they look different. Again, you don't think that your blue shirt is actually changing, um, even though there is this perceptual change. Um, so this is this idea that objects have constant color, they have constant brightness, they have constant shape, and they have constant size. So size constancy um, is the idea that, that the object's size doesn't change, even when one's distance from it varies. So again, we've all done that where we've kind of, you know, put our hands around a far off object um, and kind of like estimated how big it was in our fingers. Um, you can sometimes take those pictures where there's famous monuments behind you. Maybe you have the Washington Monument behind you between your two hands. Um, the images of people trying to push over the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Um, these are playing on that kind of idea of perceptual constancy. Um, the images themselves are smaller when you're farther away for something. We don't think that the Washington Monument has shrunk because you're further away from it. We don't think that the Leaning Tower of Pisa is all of a sudden your, your giant and you can push it over. We know that it's an issue of depth and that's because of size constancy. Another one we have is shape constancy. So the door is an ex a great example. When you look at a door that's closed straight on, it's giving you a rectangular image on your retina. However, when you start to open that door, the, change, the shape of that object changes across your retina. Now you don't perceive this change because you have shape constancy. Um, especially for familiar objects, um, we don't then perceive these changes even though there is this retinal change. So think back to that Ames video, the Ames illusion video we watched in the first lecture. Um, it really was playing on this size constancy and shape constancy. This idea that we expect these things, these properties of distance, these properties of shape um, to exist. And it played on that um, so that you could, that the woman looked shorter on one side of the room than she did in the other side of the room. Um, again, that was the issue that they were, because they were playing on these, our top down processing of size constancy and shape constancy. I promise we talk about it, the dress. Uh, color constancy um, is our ability to perceive familiar objects as having consistent color. So the issue with the dress was really a lighting issue. If you saw the dress as blue and black, your brain interpreted one kind of lighting. If you saw the dress as white as gold, your brain presumed a different color of lighting, a different illumination pattern. Depending on those two things is what you, colors you saw the dress. Um, I personally, when it first happened, I could scroll through my Facebook feed um, and I would see it as blue and black and another image I would see it as white and gold. And so mine kind of went back and forth. My illumination um, kind of perception was changing. Um, and so that's why I was freaking people out that the dress was different colors. Um, it was what you were interpreting um, based on what kind of illumination you thought that the dress was under. So color constancy is the idea that they have consistent color um, even in illumination changes. A great example of this is to kind of look at a building that you're familiar with kind of outside in your window, um, look at it you know, at night, look at it in the morning, look at it when it's raining, look at it when it's sunny, you don't think that building is changing color. 
that building's image on your eye is changing color, but you don't perceive this color change because you know that the lighting is changing and so that the illumination is affecting your perception of that color. So you don't perceive this color change because you have color constancy. Okay, that ends our lecture on vision. Um, I'll see you next time in class and we'll talk about hearing.